Good morning. Good morning. How are you? <clears throat> I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. Well, happy Friday. Happy Friday. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Here we go. Let's start off with common words. Ready? Excellent awaiting district pass telegram heavy October study learn advice opening include similar allowed loss average offered entitled promise transportation death worse besides looks arrangements easy move wouldn't Satisfied, samples, mistake, stating, intended, field, length, pudding, informed, purchased, satisfied, exactly, available, snow, hair, satisfaction, outside, properly, superintendent, lonesome, included, selling, figure, 50, perfectly, truth, west, keeping, inside. All right, let's do some common phrases. Here we go. Which have, which have been, which have had, which he, which he believed, which he believes, which he feels, which he felt, which he had, which he is, which he knows, which he recalled, which he recalls, which he recollected, which he recollects, which he remembered, which he remembers, which he shall, which he should, which he understands, which he wanted, which he wants, which he was, which he will, which he would, which I am, which I believe, which I believed, which I could, which I feel, which I felt, which I had, which I have had, which I have, which I have been, which I recall, which I recalled, which I recollect, which I recollected, which I remember, which I remembered, which I say, which I shall, which I should, which I understand, which I want, which I wanted, which I was, which I, it, or excuse me, which is, which shall. I almost said which I is. All right, let's do some consonant compounds that focus on initial SL. Ready? The slim, slight, slender girl ate the coleslaw. There was a slight slant to the slipshod job. If you drink slow gin, don't use a slingshot on your sloop. People with slogans aren't slow or slouchy. He was sliding down the slope looking for a slice of cheese. She looked slender and slinky and not at all sloppy. He owned a sloop named Slumber Sleuth. The sleuth was slim and slipped through the sliding glass doors. Sleigh rides are fun if the sleet is slippery enough. Cut a piece of a sliver of sloppy joe. Slow down slowly or slam into the wall. The slab was slack and on a slight slant. Slit-eyed sly people use slingshots. Slippers slip on slippery slimy floors. Slate blue sleds with slats slide. A splatter like slabs of slippery soap. Slow paste, slow pokes, love slow ovens. Slash the slate on a slow slant. The slovenly slop slunk slyly and slowly away. The slide trombone made slithery, sleepy sounds. All right. I've got one more for you, and this focuses on DR, initial DR. Here we go. Drag lines are used for dredging. He drew the drawer prize after the dreadful drama. The dragster drove in the drag race at the drag strip. The drifter drank so much draft beer that he became drunk. A dreadful dragonfly landed on her dress. The draperies were draped right over the drain pipe. The dray ran over the droopy dead dragon. 
She wore her new dress to the drive-in with her dream boat. The driver became drowsy while driving. The drought ended when the dreary drizzle drifted down. The baby dribble, dribbled and drooled after his drink. The drab draperies drove her to drink. The dragoon used a drake to kill the dragon. After the rain, her drenched dress drooped. The drunk drooled when he saw the draft beer. The drone of the drill was louder than drums. Sheila dripped dried her drenched dress. He drank the draft beer because he was dry. Dracula dripped and dribbled blood on the drapes. It was a drastic way to drug the drunk. All right. <clears throat> Let's do some tangle tamers. Here we go. Actually, let me see here. All right. Here we go. Flexible expenses, malnourishment evident, accumulated indebtedness, penniless elderly, garrison captured, political corruption, boomerang transition, sensational abduction, eliminates maintenance, lobbyist demonstrations, triumphantly crossing, despite paralysis, Lying unconscious, section toilet, parquet flooring, virtually ignored, numbered consecutively, non-environmental issues, illegally imprisoned, commemorative whistles, clamoring for independence, double-decker trains, campaign to maintain, heart-lung resuscitator, demanding abolishment, international criticism, institutional investigation, forcibly annexed, gustatory delights, grungily industrial, natural causes, program coordinator, disguised guerrillas, opposition unrest, advisory board, suspension automatic, and budgetary gridlock. All right, let's do some legal phrases. Here we go. Degree of proof, presumption of innocence, statements of the witnesses, full, fair, and impartial jury, uh, credibility of the witnesses, recover upon the contention, recall this charge, interest, bias, or prejudice, ordinarily prudent person, absolutely no presumption in the event that no affirmative defense more likely so than not so performance of your duty benefit of the doubt innocent until proven guilty exclude from consideration reaching your verdict change of policy agency relationship unless prohibited record high population prior act performed denotes legal authority, status, condition, and capacity, continue the relationship, plaintiffs exhibit 11B, mutuality of estoppel, heavy duty effort, appropriate to appropriation, recent public surveys, reasonable and ordinary care, exercise of reasonable care, has failed to prove the evidence, informing your opinion, with bad purpose. <clears throat> All right, names and addresses. Here we go. Arlena M. Bannon, B-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, 908 East Penn Road, Hoopiston, Illinois, 60942. Ms. Bernadine F. Steikeline, S-T-E-C-K-E-L-L-E-I-N, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, 600 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203. Patrick H. Kruger, K-R-U-E-G-E-R, -E -E Presto Products, P-R-E-S-T-O, P 
P.O. Box 2390, Appleton, Wisconsin, 45913, Carlos C. Cadef, C-A-D-U-F-F, -F, 415 Van Dyke Street, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55119, Sarah Jane Werner, W-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E 325 River Drive, Appleton, Louisiana, 70915. Sheila A. Graham, G-R-A-H-A-M, P.O. Box 883, Rye, Texas, 77369. Samuel L. Jarrett, J-A-R-R-E-T-T, -T, 58 Michaels Street, Hackensack, New Jersey, 07601. Ryder R. Clark, C-L-A-R-K, Route 1, Box 39, Sprout Springs, Virginia, 24593. Cynthia B. Tanner, T-A-N-N-E-R, Allstate Insurance, Allstate Plaza South Corporation, Northbrook, Illinois, 60062. All right. I have a drill here that focuses on where, when, and weather. Here we go. Where is the car keys? When was the dog lost? Do you know whether I can? Leave when the time comes. I don't know whether you can. Move where the sun shines. Tell me whether you will go. I will call when I get there. Where were you yesterday? When is the report due? Where is the old file? Tell me whether you won. Call when you are well. Find out whether he is home. Tell her where to put the tray. Tell us whether the case was dismissed. When and where will the party be held? Where it will be depends on whether it rains. When will you know whether he can go? It is a question of whether the advice is good. When did you check on whether the train arrived? When is it possible to see whether the mail is here? The question is not whether you want to, but where and when. When did you check to see whether the credit was given? Where and when can you send me the shipment? When can you tell me whether you can come? Let me see whether it is due and when it must be paid. When you receive the notice, where will you send it? Find out when and where it was shipped. When are you going to know whether it is here? All right, these are going to be uh, words that are plural versus words that you come back for the Z sound. Okay, so let me give you the words first and then I'll give you the sentences. Saws, sauce. Rise, rice. Prize, price. Sins, sense. Hens, hence. Spies, spice. Pulls, pulse. Grows, gross. Plays, place. Phase, face. Falls, false. Trays, trace. Here are your sentences. Who won that prize? The price has risen. It will take a prize. His sins were many. He taught since May. Wash your sins away. Were you dozing today? Take a proper dose. The jury dozed off. Order two full trays. There isn't a trace. The trays are full. They saw both plays. Put it in its place. She plays too hard. The phase is finished. His face told the story. Phase out the old stock. The hens are laying now. Henceforth be on time. Purchase some new hens. Are they raising the horses? Are they racing the horses? You should raise them. The old man had many falls. He admitted it was false. How many falls did I have? The spies were arrested. Spice up that dull report. Pull the spies on the trial. Alfalfa grows wild. I ordered a gross. Corn grows in Iowa. The saws were dull. The taco needs sauce. He saws his own wood. Watch for the signs. He teach science, or excuse me, he teaches science. They are new signs. He pulls very hard. Take her pulse again. She pulls the wagon. Our prices will rise. Try our rice cakes. 
the water is rising. I've got some land description. I will read this at 180. Okay. All right, here we go. Wait, hold on. Wind my watch up. Okay. The owner's names and the description of the land and the properties which will be benefited or damaged by the construction of said lateral concrete are as follows to wit. Joseph Davis, Southeast one quarter, Northwest one quarter, section 19, Township 113, range 40, Northeast one quarter, Northwest one quarter, section 19, Township 113, range 40. Brian Hansen, now Northwest one quarter, Southwest one quarter, section 19, township 113, range 40. Casey Lee, Northeast one quarter, Southwest one quarter, section 19, township 113, range 40. Mason Aldrich, Northwest one quarter, Northwest one quarter, section 30, township 113, range 40, Northeast one quarter, Northeast one quarter, section 25, township 113, range 41. Adam and Josephine Beckwith, Northwest one quarter, Southwest one quarter, section 30, township 113, range 40. Mason and Tracy Anderson, Northeast one quarter, Southeast one quarter, section 24, township 113, range 41. Scott J. Snyder, Northwest one quarter, Northeast one quarter, section 25, township 113, range 41. Hector Loomis, Southwest one quarter, Northeast one quarter, section 25, Township 113, range 41. All right. I'm going to give you some literary. I'm going to start at 180, but I'm going to move to one or to 225. Okay. All right. And the subject here is furnishing necessaries to wife. Here we go. Now, it is the law of this state that a man, when he enters into the marriage relation, takes upon himself the duty of supplying his wife with the necessaries, and if through his own fault he does not, the wife by reason of the marriage relation has the implied authority as his agent to procure such necessaries, and the husband is responsible for what is so supplied. If the husband refuses to furnish necessaries to his wife, she may secure them elsewhere, and he is liable under the law, therefore. However, one who sells goods to his wife can recover from the husband only upon proof that the husband authorized the purchase or that he refused or neglected to provide a suitable support for his wife and that the goods sold were, in fact, necessaries. The term necessaries in this regard is not limited to articles of food or clothing required to preserve life or personal decency, but include such articles of utility or ornament as are sustainable to maintain the wife according to her husband's station in life. Now the plaintiff claims that the goods furnished were for the necessaries and that some have not been paid for. When a person renders services or furnishes the money or goods to another with the latter's knowledge and consent, the law presumes that the person for whom such services were performed or goods and money furnished intends to pay for the same. When a person claims that such goods and money were furnished voluntarily, the burden of proof rests upon such person to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that such goods and money were furnished without expectation of compensation or that the same were not paid or were not to be paid for. And even though there was no contract of sale, the presumption is that the payment was intended. Knowledge to the wife in this case would be knowledge to the husband if the transactions with the plaintiff were for the necessaries of life inasmuch as the wife is by implication of the law, the agent of the husband in procuring necessar necessaries for herself. The plaintiff cannot recover in this case except for the funeral expenses which are admitted unless he expected to be paid for the goods and the monies furnished by him. So if you find that he gave these alleged necessaries to the defendant's wife and expected no compensation therefore, 
then he cannot recover except for the funeral expenses. The burden of proof rests upon the plaintiff in this case to prove by the preponderance of the evidence what goods and money he actually furnished to the defendant's wife and that such goods and money were necessary for the said wife and used by her as such and what the value of said goods and money was and that the defendant failed to supply the necessaries to his wife. If you find that the goods and the money so furnished were necessaries and that the defendant failed to suitably provide for his wife, then the amount you find to be the value of the goods and the money so furnished will be the amount that the plaintiff will be entitled to recover in this case. Unless you find under the rules given you that the plaintiff did not expect compensation therefore. To briefly sum up the issues, if you find under the rules given you from the evidence that the plaintiff furnished necessaries to the defendant's wife as claimed by him and that such necessaries were not furnished gratuitously and that the defendant failed to suitably provide for his wife, then you will find a verdict in the plaintiff's favor for the amount that you find him entitled to. On the other hand, if you find that the plaintiff did not furnish necessaries to the defendant's wife, or you find the defendant suitably provided for her support, or you find that the evidence equally balanced or preponderating in the defendant's favor on these questions, or you find from the preponderance of the evidence that the plaintiff did furnish necessaries, but that the necessaries were furnished without expectation of the compensation therefore, then you will find that the plaintiff is entitled to no compensation except with respect to the funeral expenses, which amount to $33,000 and which the defendant admits he is liable for. In any event, you will find a verdict in the plaintiff's favor for not less than $33,000. Right. Now I've got some jury charge here and it, the subject is fraud and deceit. Okay, and I know the other one, you know, you did hear some of the jury charge uh, terms, but for the most part, it was just interesting talking about the necessaries of the wife, so. All right, so let's do an actual jury charge here. The subject is fraud and deceit. And I'm gonna start this at 200 and work my way to 225. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the issues in this case are issues of fraud and deceit. Fraudulent representation or fraud as the term here is used may be defined as false statements of material facts in a transaction made by one party to another, made with the knowledge of their falsity, or made as a positive statement of fact, without reference to their truth or falsity, and made with the intent that the other party shall act thereon. When such other party believes such statements and relies thereon, and is induced thereby to enter into a contract or transaction, and the statements are false and the damages results to him, then such statements are fraud, which entitles the party injured to recover the damages. Fraud is never presumed and must always be proved, and the burden of proof rests upon the parties asserting the fraud, the defendant in this case, to prove by a fair preponderance of the evidence, that is, the greater weight of the evidence, that he was defrauded and as claimed by him. If you find that the evidence on the other hand of this question evenly balanced or that it preponderates in the favor of the plaintiff, then you will find a verdict in the plaintiff's favor. In order to recover on the grounds of fraudulent or fraudulent representation, the party claiming to have been defrauded must have believed and relied upon the false statements made by the other parties in the transaction. And if the party claiming fraud had knowledge of the real facts in connection with the transaction in question and relied upon his own knowledge and information and did not rely upon the statements made to him, then there is no fraud because the party asserting the fraud is not deceived. In this case, there is no fraud insofar as the contents of the agreement in Exhibit 4 and as concerned because it is admitted by the plaintiff that John Henry read the statement, the agreement, Exhibit 4, and knew about the contents thereof, and he was not deceived as to what Exhibit 4 contained. The only question of fraud in this case is whether the defendants agreed upon to execute a promissory note for $30,000 to the plaintiff and delivered Exhibit 4 purporting to be such a note and fraudulently stated to Tyler Moore that Exhibit 4 was a promissory note for $30,000 and was the note referred to in Exhibit 4 
and whether pursuant thereto, Tyler believed that said instrument to be a promissory note for $30,000. If under the rules given you that you find and believe from the evidence that the defendant Morris represented the defendants at the time of making the agreement of the settlement represented and stated to Tyler acting for the plaintiff in this case, that the defendants would execute to the plaintiffs a promissory note for $30,000 and that later Morris delivered exhibit four to the said Tyler and then stated to him that the said exhibit four was a promissory note for $30,000 and was the note referred to in exhibit one. And you find that these statements and the making of exhibit four were done for the purpose of cheating and defrauding the plaintiff as claimed. And you further find that Tyler believed said representations and believed that said exhibit four was a promissory note on which the defendants were personally liable for and was the note referred to in exhibit four and relied and acted thereon, then you will find a verdict in the plaintiff's favor for $30,000 with interest added as provided for in said exhibit four. On the other hand, if you fail to so find from the preponderance of the evidence or you find that the evidence equally balanced on either of these issues, or if you find that Morris did not make the fraudulent representations as claimed by the plaintiff, or you find that said exhibit four was in accordance with the agreement of the parties, or that the said Tyler at the time of the receiving said exhibit four knew about the contents and the terms thereof, then in either such case, you will find a verdict in defendant's favor of no cause of action. If you find a verdict in plaintiff's favor in this case, it will be for the full amount of $30,000 with interest added as provided for in exhibit four. If you find a verdict in defendant's favor, it will be the usual verdict of no cause of action. All right. How are we doing on time? Okay, let's get started with some Q&A. Again, I'll start this at 180 and work my way to 225. Plaintiff will be questioning, but court comes in and then it will switch over to cross-examination. Just uh, date this. All right, here we go. Ready? Now, Mr. Taylor, when you say you struck Mr. Bartlin once with the stick and then you struck him a second time and then the third time the stick broke, were you just trying to retain or restrain his advances or were you going to strike him so that he would let go of the knife? I was trying to knock him senseless. Do you think that the third blow that you used was the strongest blow of the three? I don't think it was any stronger than any of the other ones, although I used every bit of strength to deliver it. Who took the knife away from Samuel? Well, Darla did, his wife. And after the knife was taken away by Darla, did you see whether it was taken? Did you see whether it was where it was put? Well, no, right after she got hit, her son Dave took it. Did you see what he did with it? No. Did you get a good look at the knife? Yes, I did. Could you please describe for the court what type of knife it was? It just looked like a large butcher knife. How long would you estimate the blade to be? Approximately six to eight inches. Would you describe what clothing you had on at that time? I had on a white t-shirt, some blue jeans, a brown leather vest, and riding boots. Your Honor, Your Honor I have a white cardboard box which previously has been marked for identification as people's one. You have had an opportunity to examine this. Is that right, Mrs. Delaney? Well, go ahead. And I have examined it, yes. Okay, from the box in the presence of the clerk, I will extract certain objects. I will hand the witness this first one marked people's 1A for identification. Go ahead, I have no objection. Could you tell us what that is? This is my white t-shirt. Did you have that on at the time you were stabbed with the knife? Yes, I did. Prior to this assault on your person and directing your attention now to the area in the back of the t-shirt, was that cut there? No, it wasn't. Okay, I will offer that in evidence as People's 1A, Your Honor. It will be received in evidence as People's 1A. Mr. Taylor, showing you People's 1B for identification, 
a pair of jeans and what appears to be a tannish red stain on the front and rear portions. Are these, are those the pants that you had on on that date? Yes, they are. I will offer these in evidence as people's 1B, Your Honor. For the record, these jeans have a large rip at the top of the pants towards the rear. Was that there prior to your assault? No. Was the brown stain there prior to the assault? No, Your Honor. The jeans will be received in evidence as people's 1B. Is this the vest that you had on on that day? Yes, sir, it is. Directing your attention again to a torn portion on the back surrounded by a reddish brown stain. Were they there prior to your being struck? No, they were not. I will offer that as 1C, Your Honor. It will be received as 1C in evidence. Okay, after this attack, were you taken to the hospital by the by Sergeant Hale of the Nevada State Police? Yes, sir, I was. And were you still wearing this clothing at that time? That's correct. And did anyone else accompany you to the hospital? No, no, sir. Okay, I don't believe I have any further questions, Your Honor. All right, you may cross-examine Mrs. Delaney. Thank you. Now, Mr. Taylor, approximately how many years had you known Mr. Bartland before this incident occurred? I'm not sure when he was elected to the city council. I guess I knew him about three years. Would you say that you are active in the local government in the city of Las Vegas? I am not active in the city government. I am a concerned citizen. I want to know how my tax dollars are being spent. All right, when you have complaints and objections about the things that are going on in the city of Las Vegas, do you take your problems to the city council meetings? No. Okay, did you have some objection to the way that Samuel Bartland was conducting his office? No, well, yes, I did. And what was that complaint? I did not agree with his defense of the use of the chokehold when arrests are being made. Did you have some dislike for him before this incident? Yes, I did. What was the dislike based upon? Well, it was based on the platform that he used to get elected, too many promises, and he hasn't done a thing except collect his salary. Okay, I need to see counsel in my chambers. Okay, so let's switch transcripts. <clears throat> let's go ahead and finish this one up. All right, this one I'm gonna start at 200 and work my way to 225. We're almost done with this one. All right, defense is questioning. So this was in a safety deposit box in the bank, right? What bank is that? Foothill Independent. What papers are in from your house? Well, the deeds are there and the insurance papers and the house deeds. Can you get that this afternoon so Mrs. Data Boy can bring it back with her tomorrow? I'll try to get to it. Yeah, you have a copy over there. You gave a, I gave you a copy there this morning. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, the whole copy, all of the copies are there. I don't have to bring it tomorrow. Well, I didn't see that. Excuse me. That's why this is the one we have the objection to not answer the question. That was in a previous exhibit which you had in your insurance policy. This morning, the deeds and everything in that bunch of paper are all right there. Okay, exhibit LL or KK, one of them. Thank you very much. I apologize. Okay, so before I forget, you are going to notify your people that this, the fact of what's going to take place tomorrow, because apparently a couple of your clients haven't showed up. So, right, okay. And a couple have called our office and we'd like you to make sure that you get the notice out to them so that they are not showing up. This is, we don't want to be in a position of telling them over the phone, you really shouldn't call us and your deposition is scheduled for 10 in the morning. Right, okay, is that agreeable? I've been trying to notify them, but I've been here when they are calling at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're trying to reach this office because they haven't, I haven't been able to call them back, you know, when their deposition is going to be because none of us have been able to know because Mrs. Briscoe or somebody hasn't been able to attend. Okay, now if you can please send out a notice or something like that. Right, okay, but I do need a copy of the notice. Okay, I'll get one to you. Okay, and for the record, I was talking to her about the deposition and she said, give me a time so that I don't miss any of my classes or any of my tests, which is very important to her because this is a final year. She is going to college next year. 
okay, this is for her final year in high school. Yes, she is graduating this June. So I'd like to make sure that she doesn't have any special classes to go to tomorrow. Otherwise, it's no problem. But I can bring my son, Amur, if you need him. He is only six years old. Okay, is his deposition set? Yes, they wanted to take his deposition, but maybe that's just a typo. He is only six years old. Do you want his deposition? I mean, we will produce him. He probably should come with his mother, don't you think? What do you guys want to do? What do you think? Well, one of his parents, yes. But I mean, does it matter? The child is six years old. He needs a deposition? That is my question. I mean, what do you expect from a boy who is six years old? To ask him some questions. Sure, but if he is going to ask for damages, we will take his deposition. He will at least explain to you what difficulty he has gone through. But I don't know whether you guys really want him. Sure, it would help. Okay, so you will bring him with you tomorrow? Yes, I can do that. Okay, thank you very much. Is that agreeable? That's fine with me. All right, so we will be here tomorrow with the six-year-old boy at 10 o'clock in the morning. We will finish up his father's deposition and then take his. And then we will have Mrs. Databoy here on Thursday and I'll contact my clients and let them know what we're at. Okay, wait, wait, wait. How about Wednesday? I meant Wednesday, I'm sorry. Tomorrow is Tuesday. Wednesday is, I wouldn't expect to take very much time with the young lad, right. If we could finish Mr. Databoy in the morning and perhaps part of the afternoon and take his, his deposition tomorrow afternoon, then we can get started on Mrs. Databoy's Wednesday morning. That's what I meant to say was Wednesday, right? Sorry about that. Is that agreeable? That's agreeable with me, fine. All right, there was a stipulation at the end of the first session, and I think it will cover this session also. Let me review it for a minute. As far as I'm concerned, the same stipulation would... Would you read it again? Because I did not hear it the last time. Sure, Mr. St. Peter stipulated on your behalf from your office. It reads, the parties here are in agreement that this deposition will be suspended to be continued at a mutually convenient time to all of the parties. That of course is tomorrow. It says the original transcript will be forwarded to Mr. Atkinson's office. Have you received that yet? I can't say to be honest with you whether or not it says signature is suspended until the deposition is concluded. But if for some reason Mr. Databoy's deposition could not be concluded, then the stipulation is to the effect that the original transcript of the deposition, whether it is signed or unsigned by him under penalty of perjury, could have the same force and effect as though it were signed at the time of trial. Yes, I remember that, so stipulated. Okay, that's agreeable to you, thank you. We're going to continue with the stipulation. All right, let's switch transcripts. Okay, so I'm gonna read this. We're gonna start right off at 225, okay? All right. Ready? Let's just say hypothetically, you had a make of a 1934 Packard and you're looking for a 1934 Packard and you have some names that are associated with that 1934 Packard. Would that assist you in trying to locate it? Yes, it could. If you have a general area from which the vehicle may have come from, would you be, would you expect then to go out to that general area and make inquiries about that particular vehicle? If it's not, if it's an area, for instance, that your primary responsibility is law enforcement, then you have gang details, things like that. You can go find out if the names or the vehicles that you've been given are familiar to, say, their narco narcotics area, where they run into a lot of people, where there is gang activity, where they run into people. If you have those names, then you can ask if they're familiar with the particular vehicle. If it's out of county, you can do that with the same with the other various departments by sending a notice down that you are looking for this vehicle and these are the particular vehicles that may be involved with the vehicle and perhaps they may have the information about the vehicle. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Go ahead, counsel. Now, based upon your training and experience over the years, well, let's go back to when you were with the police department. Did you ever work with other agencies, sheriff's offices, FBI, that sort of thing? Yes, I did. If you want to get the information, for instance, from, say, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office, did you find that the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office wouldn't give you the information? No, the local law enforcement agencies, as a general rule, are very easy to work with. 
okay, so there's a spirit of cooperation from one agent to the county. Yes, and the local, in the federal level, that is a different story. In the local level, yes. In the course of your experience and your investigations, both as a police officer and as a private investigator, have you ever worked with individuals who were known in the vernacular as a snitch? Yes. Would you tell us what, the, what a snitch is? Well, a snitch is kind of a street label for a person that gives information of a criminal nature about the other person or persons generally, maybe with a drug dealer, somebody that buys drugs, maybe become arrested, then he may decide to work for a law enforcement office and give the information to law enforcement and trade for a recommendation to a court or to the district attorney's office that his sentence might be lightened. He would then turn in the information about the people, those who are selling the drugs. That's sort of the bottom line. But it goes to all of the forums, from guns to white collar crimes, all of the types of things. If you're labeled as a snitch in the penal institutions, the jails, prisons, that sort of thing, is that a good thing to be known as? No, absolutely not. And why is that? Well, once you get a snitch jacket or you're known as a snitch, you can't be trusted by anybody else. Everybody that is in a penal institution, at least a majority of the people, don't look amiably at the people that give evidence against them. So you are kind of on the lowest. You're down there with the child molesters and that kind of thing. So your life isn't worth that much if you're labeled a snitch and placed in. When you say your life isn't worth very much, your life is actually in danger, do you mean? Yes, exactly. Based upon your training and experience, you've seen situations where law enforcement might want someone who is not a snitch to appear to be a snitch? Exactly. And why might that happen? Well, there are several reasons that I know of, several instances where that was done. And in one particular case was a man that was dealing drugs that just couldn't be caught. And so the word was kind of passed along that, the, that he was giving information and was arrested on another charge and was released on bail. That is going into jail. And then getting out of jail kind of opens up another door saying that the reason he is out is because he's working for law enforcement. And so the word was kind of passed out. Pressure gets put upon him by the outside people that he is a snitch. And hopefully he'll come in or other people that may be buying the drugs from him decide he's vulnerable and not buy drugs from him. In that situation, the individual was taken into custody, arrested, taken to jail, then just released. Yes. And the idea was then that the law enforcement was sending out the message that he's getting special treatment. Well, that and you ask your snitches to put the word out. There was a lot of various occasions, but it has, it has happened. If you were interviewing an individual and you wanted word to get around, say that he was a snitch, might you walk that individual past all of the other prisoners sort of to be seen together to an interview room so that he is seen by everybody else? Well, that's happened, or in narcotics, you may go to the jail and make a visit with somebody. Of course, everybody knows you're a narcotics officer, and here you are talking to this person. Okay, so then the idea of being that the general population will begin to believe that the person is a snitch, right? Suppose you wanted a particular individual to know that the individual was a snitch, and he really wouldn't cooperate. Would it be a procedure to dress him out in civilian clothing? and walk him in the courtroom where the other prisoner was sitting in the courtroom, perhaps about to start the trial or a hearing and have the one labeled, he's in civilian clothing? Yes, yes, that might give an indication depending upon the mentality of the people that saw him. Let's assume that you are an officer. You worked undercover narcotics, I believe, didn't you? Yes, I did. Let's assume that you are an undercover officer in the narcotics division and you don't want you don't want your identity exposed, but you do want the word to get around in jail or the other institutions that a particular individual is a snitch. Might you put on a ninja mask and take the person, walk him down there to the booking past another person so they can see him walking with you while you're masked? Wouldn't that tend to get that word out to the other inmates? Objection, Your Honor. It calls for speculation. The objection is overruled. You may answer if you know, sir. Could you give me a hypothetical again? He was doing what? An officer is wearing a ninja mask over his face, like a ski mask or something like that. And then he comes and gets the prisoner and walks him past the other inmates and takes him down to an interview room and turns him over to some other officers. You're assuming the officer is in plain clothes? Yes, he's in plain clothes. Is that some kind of a message being sent to the other inmates? Unless the officer is lone ranger, there's something being done. 
the only thing I can draw from this is that my times officers that are working in an undercover position when they go on the raids will wear masks to conceal their identity so they can continue in an undercover capacity and anybody who is being involved in any kind of raids or I've seen these searches going on these well, they see these guys out there with the mask on, and that would not be the full SWAT gear, but with a mask. This would be just a person in, say, street clothes, maybe with a police jacket. They wear the mask. They may then make the assumption that, hey, that guy is an undercover guy. What is he doing with whoever he happens to be walking with? It depends on the mentality of the people that see it as to whether or not that would be a snitch message or what kind of a message really well, excuse me, Mr. Lonsfer, have you, in the course of your training and experience, ever done an investigation where an individual was trying to avoid being labeled as a snitch, so he confessed to another crime? He was trying to avoid being labeled as a snitch and treated as a snitch. I don't, I don't know of any, personally, where someone was attempting to avoid being a snitch. I've seen people confess to crimes that they didn't do. They didn't do for lots of other different reasons, but not specifically that one. You never had that specific one? Not that particular one, no. Have you ever had to anyone confess to a crime or known of anyone to confess of a crime that he didn't actually commit? Yes. And have you known more than one case like that? Yes, I've worked with several when I was in narcotics. Why would those cases individuals confess to a crime that he didn't commit? Well, in a lot of the cases I would get as a narcotics investigator, the person would take the heat for the crime rather than pass it upon somebody else maybe higher than he is. I've had wives or husbands confess to crimes in order to protect their spouse. I've had other people that just wanted to go to jail, you know, not particularly on a homicide. Every once in a while, somebody would come in and would confess to a crime. In your work in narcotics, did you find that the people who were involved in the narcotics world tended to give their name and addresses and telephone numbers to another person that they perhaps were working with who was selling narcotics or they were buying narcotics from? Generally, no, they would know where somebody else is selling at. In some cases, you know, these people have grown up together. They know each other. In other cases, you're down there doing an illegal transaction in the first place. The idea is sell the dope, get the money, and get out of there. Do you know the vernacular street scene? Yes, yes. What does the street scene mean? Well, it's kind of an area. In other words, if you're in the streets in your particular neighborhood, you know what's going on in that particular neighborhood. A person that might be streetwise would know what they that the woman in the short dress isn't a model, she's a prostitute. They would know down here on this corner, you don't want to go down there on that corner because that's where the thieves hang around and they all sell drugs off of the corner. Here at some of the house houses are gang houses, not a good place to hang out. They may know the gang members enough to know maybe about the scenes, the people, things like that. Knowing the neighborhood that you're in would be the street scene. Is it uncommon for the street scene for people to go by also known as monikers, as you've called them, rather than giving a full name and address? No, it's very common. Okay, and is it common for the other people in the neighborhood to know an individual, not by his official or given name, but by his moniker name? Yes, it's also common by the also known as name. Okay, in other words, if I had a nickname Chubby Joe and I'm in the street scene, I'm hearing Snickers, then it would not be uncommon for you if you wanted to locate me to walk into the neighborhood and say, I'm looking for Chubby Joe, you would be able to find me? Probably. As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite though. If you're coming down and you ask for D. Dan, they may know him. If his name is Bill Smith, they may not know him as Bill Smith. Is that common in the narcotics world itself? Yes, very. And that if you have some particular names and you are doing a narcotics investigation, could you, for instance, you knew that this particular individual hung around in a particular area of Los Angeles. If you contacted the narcotics division in the Los Angeles area and told them that you were looking for Chubby Joe and he hung around a particular area or whatever, is it likely that they would refer you to somebody or refer you to somebody that might know him? I would think in most cases, yes. And is it common for the various agencies to share that kind of information? Yes, thank you, I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bristol. Mr. Abakley, you may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Lonsford. Hi, how are you? Where would you go to look for a person with, say, the moniker of D. Dan, if that moniker was not in any computer, or you weren't able to identify a law enforcement agency that was familiar with that? Do we know a city or a state that it's in? 
say in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area, do we know a particular specific area in Los Angeles? Just moniker D. Dan in LA. It could be Venice Beach or Redondo Beach or some other area. Well, maybe even North Hollywood. Well, that is a widespread area. If there are no law enforcement records of that particular moniker and you don't have an area other than that kind of a general area like that, then you'd have to resort to the courthouse records to see if there are any records or filings where a person had been arrested and had given that name at that time. If that fails, then the only other way you could do it would be to send up a request to the patrol officers or anybody that comes across anybody like that. The police forward that information because these guys make the stops. They get the information on a daily basis, but with just that information, just DDAN and the general Los Angeles area, if it's not in the court files and it's not in any law enforcement records, then you're probably in pretty hard shape. Okay, did you ever handle such homicide investigations when you were with the San Bernardino Police Department? I only assisted in homicides when they were narcotics related. Okay, so you are familiar with the way that those investigations were conducted? Yes. Was there an unlimited amount of time that was devoted to the investigation of those? It depends upon, unfortunately, not on the type of case. You know, if it was a highly publicity case or whether it was not. Let's say that it is relatively a high publicity case. Let's say it is really high and you have the information that there is a person by the moniker name of D-Dan somewhere in the LA area. Would you expect that they would send as many man hours or spend as many man hours and as much time as it would take to find that person? Or do you think that it would be an unreasonable thing to do? It would depend upon the information that D-Dan had. Okay, the information that we've previously given you in the hypothetical. Well, that's what I'm saying. In other words, if D-Dan was a major witness or was an extremely important witness to the case or was a suspect in the case, then a lot of man hours may be put out to try to exhaust, exhaust finding him, particularly in a high publicity case. All right. Let's do some read back. All right, so let's see this read back has defense questioning and it's a continuation from Wednesday night okay so I'm going to read this one set 225 then 200 then 180 okay all right here we go In other words, the substance of that conversation at that time was that Mr. Weeks told Mr. Stanton that he needed money and you said he didn't know how much it was, but they would have to find out from the accountant. Is that a fair summation? Yes, sir. All right. Did anybody say anything to you about putting any additional money in the dealership at that meeting? I don't think so. I think they were going to have a meeting the next day. Did you have any discussion during this meeting about what would happen if the money wasn't put in? Yes, sir, we did. And what was that discussion? That we were going to have Mr. Weeks surrender the store to us. Did Mr. Weeks say anything about what his understanding was? That if he didn't have the funds in there March 20, we would have him surrender the store. Did Mr. Weeks say anything at that particular meeting about whether or not he had any discussions with any representative of the corporation? Not really, no, sir. All right, after this evening conversation on March 16, when is the next time you had a conversation with Mr. Stanton? I believe it was the next day. All right, approximately what time of the day, if you remember, seven in the morning. All right, when was the next conversation that you had with Mr. Stanton after that? The next one was the following day at home in the morning. All right, what time in the morning was that? 6.15, I think that's about right because I remember he woke me up. I had a small baby at the time. What did Mr. Stanton tell you at that time? I don't really remember the substance. You don't have any independent recollection, is that right? No, sir, I don't. All right, let's do it again at 200. In other words, the substance of that conversation at that time was that Mr. Weeks told Mr. Stanton that he needed money and you said you didn't know how much it was but they would have to find out from the accountant. Is that a fair summation? Yes, sir. All right. 
did anybody say anything to you about putting any additional money in the dealership at that meeting? I don't think so. I think they were going to have a meeting the next day. Did you have any discussion during this meeting about what would happen if the money wasn't put in? Yes, sir, we did. And what was that discussion? That we were going to have Mr. Weeks surrender the store to us. Did Mr. Weeks say anything about what his understanding was? That if he didn't have the funds in there March 20, we would have him surrender the store. Did Mr. Weeks say anything at that particular meeting about whether or not he had had any discussions with any representative of the corporation? Not really, no, sir. All right, after this evening conversation on March 16, when is the next time you had a conversation with Mr. Stanton? I believe it was the next day. All right, approximately what time of the day, if you remember? Seven in the morning. All right, when was the next conversation that you had with Mr. Stanton after that? The next one was the following day at home in the morning. All right, what time in the morning was that? 6.15, I think that's about right because I remember he woke me up. Okay, I had a small baby at the time. What did Mr. Stanton tell you at that time? I don't really remember the substance. You don't have any independent recollection, is that right? No, sir, I don't. Shoot, I added an okay in there. I don't know why I did that. Okay, I wrote it down, so now I'll know. Let me do the read back. All right, so let's do it again at 180. There we go. In other words, the substance of that conversation at that time was that Mr. Weeks told Mr. Stanton that he needed money, and you said you didn't know how much it was, but they would have to find out from the accountant. Is that a fair summation? Yes, sir. All right. Did anybody say anything to you about putting any additional money in the dealership at that meeting? I don't think so. I think they were going to have a meeting the next day. Did you have any discussion during this meeting about what would happen if the money wasn't put in? Yes, sir, we did. And what was that discussion? That we were going to have Mr. Weeks surrender the store to us. Did Mr. Weeks say anything about what his understanding was? That if he didn't have the funds in there March 20, we would have him surrender the store. Did Mr. Weeks say anything at that particular meeting about whether or not he had had any discussions with any representative of the corporation? Not really, no, sir. All right, after this evening conversation on March 16, when is the next time you had a conversation with Mr. Stanton? I believe it was the next day. All right, approximately what time of the day, if you remember? Seven in the morning. All right, when was the next conversation that you had with Mr. Stanton after that? The next one was the following day at home in the morning. All right, what time in the morning was that? 6.15, I think that's about right because I remember he woke me up. I had a small baby at the time. What did Mr. Stanton tell you at that time? I don't really remember the substance. You don't have any independent recollection, is that right? No, sir, I don't. All right. Do you do anything for when they say, I don't really remember versus I don't remember? Or you do know, you just, what do you do? Because I was going to ask you that the other day, because I, I know that one always throws me because there is no, you know, there's, there's nothing out there for that. I don't really remember. And it does, it always throws me off. So um, the only thing that I've heard of from people that they do is they do what, cause I don't remember is Y O R. So some people do Y long O R for really, cause mm. of, you know, I don't really remember. I don't really know you could do Y long O N, but I, I write it out because I don't know. I just feel like I would doubt myself like, Ooh, is that what they said? Yeah. But that's the only thing I've heard of. That I mean, I, I even wish that, I mean, 
because I actually do long O for I don't even. So it's, it is kind of, it is kind of risky. Yeah. I don't know if I should, but I don't, I come, I do it for, I don't even, because in my mind, like, I don't even, and then I come back for the no or the remember or whatever. So I would, I would even like something for just, I don't really, and then come back for the no, like, cause I hear the, I don't really like so fast in my mind, Yeah. but I can't, I can't do, I don't RL cause that's, I don't recall, or I don't know. I was just curious anyways, that, yeah. that happens like all the time. So I know. And you know, those sheets, the brief sheets with the, I don't know, I don't remember. They don't address anything for, I don't really. I'll have to look on my brief group on Facebook because I'm sure they've talked about it. Yeah. I don't um, even. So have you seen, I don't even as why long E N for, I don't even. Is that what you said you do for I don't even? I, I do. I don't. No, I do long O. I do. Okay. But that, that would be better. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even. I don't. I don't know. I haven't used it that much, to be honest with you. Yeah. But Because it doesn't come up as much. I don't even. I'm trying to look and see. Some people add in an R, I guess. I don't, for I don't know. I don't really know. So the, I guess they do like yarn. For, I, yeah, I have seen that. I don't remember. Wait, no, let's see. I don't, I don't know. I have seen the R, but I don't. You can't, you can't do it for recall. So, right. or remember, I don't, right. you can only do it for I no. Know. I. Yeah, it's just hard to come up with something that consistently works for all of them. Unless you change it to long O if they say, I don't really, you know, I don't really remember. I don't really know if you change it to whatever, you know, keep the ending, remember or no, but add the long O. But like yeah. you said, then you would have to change whatever it is that you do with the long O. I don't even. See, I write, I don't even Y O and I just come back for long E N. I don't use that phrase. I don't even, I mean, I could do, well, so I could do, I don't even, I, I mean, the way I do it is long O N. So I just have to be careful that I don't mess that well, up. Or so you could close. practice it as a long E N for even, you know, and then I could do long E R L for, I don't really, uh-huh. That would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they, that is, that does come up a lot. I was, it's funny you say that. Cause I was going to ask you the other day, what do you do for? <laughs> I don't really. And then no, I don't really remember. Yeah. I'm going to practice that. I like, I like the long E like yeem. I don't even and year old. I don't, I don't really yeah. No, and I'll just come back for the no or the remember or whatever. Uh-huh. That that's the part. It just it rolls out it the first part of the phrase wants right. to roll off my fingers. So I if I really. hear the really, that'll work for me and then just come back for the whatever. I don't need it all in one stroke, you know? Right. But really, so. you figure really, if you write out really, that's two strokes. So if you could I, say, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And then I do, you have to be careful know. for, I don't recall, because I don't recall just Y-O-R-L, you know? Yeah, I think adding the, making it a long E will eliminate the more of the possibility that I would mess that up. I don't really, yeah. I'm going to, I'll make some sentences up with, I don't really. Yeah, that works for me. Okay. Yep, I'll do that. And I'm going to okay. find out for sure from Robert, like what we're doing and I'll, I'm going to call you. So today, we, okay. today we're going to, you know, we're going to figure it all out. So I'll definitely keep you contacted. So, you know, okay. Okay. All right. So, um, you let me know when you find your spot. Oh yeah. <laughs> Read that. <laughs> uh. 
see. Okay. Okay, you want to take the first one? Um, or I can. Sure, I can, whatever. Okay. Anyway. Uh, question. In other words, the substance of that conversation at that time was that Mr. Weeks told Mr. Stanton that he needed money and you said he didn't know how much it was, but they would have to find out from the accountant. Is that a fair summation? Answer, yes, sir. Awesome. Question, all right. Did anybody say anything to you about putting any additional money in the dealership at that meeting? Answer, I don't think so. I think they were going to have a meeting the next day. Question, did you have any discussion during the meeting I don't know about what would happen you have this meeting no I left out I knew there was something there but it it got swallowed up it didn't That's okay get, get there. during okay. this meeting okay during this meeting about what would happen if the money wasn't put in answer Yes, sir, we did. Question, and what was that discussion? Answer, that we were going to have Mr. Weeks surrender the store to us. Question, did Mr. Weeks say anything about what his understanding was? Answer, that he... Do you have if he? Oh, that if, yes. That if he didn't um, hang on, I'm gonna figure it out. If he didn't have the funds. Does it have the? Yes. Have. Oh, okay. Have the funds in there March 20 we would have him surrender the store awesome question did Mr. Weeks say anything at that particular meeting about whether or not he had had any discussions with any representative of the corporation? Answer, not really, no, sir. Question, all right. After this evening conversation on March 16, when is the next time you had a conversation with Mr. Stanton? Answer, I believe it was the next day. Question, all right, approximately what time of the day, if you remember? Answer, seven in the morning. Question, all right, when was the next conversation that you had with Mr. Stanton after that? Answer, the next one was the following day at home Uh, in the morning. Yep. Perfect. Question. All right. What time in the morning was that? Answer 615. I think that's about right because I remember he woke me up. Now in the 200 take, I accidentally switched back over to defense and said, okay, but in the 225 and 180, I didn't do that. And then the answer continues. I had a small baby at the time. Question, what did Mr. Stanton tell you at that time? Answer, I don't really remember the substance. 
question, you don't have any independent recollection. Is that right? Answer, no, sir, I don't. So I will make some sentences with I don't really and then different, like I don't really remember, I don't really recall, I don't really know. So like in that, so that was, I read my 225 take, so that was pretty good. good. But um, on that, I don't really remember the substance. What I actually have is I don't recall remember the substance. So I wanted to write the Y-O-R-L, you know? Yeah. And then, and then remember, but I knew what it was. So I'll, I'll do it as a long E and that'll be, that'll work for me. Yes. Anyways, that's a good one. That comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it that's that is good. I don't. Yeah, so I don't really is going to be Y long E R L, and then if they say remember, just come back for what do you do R E B? Yeah. Yeah. All so right. it'll work for anything. I don't really recall. I don't really remember. I don't really know. Cause I just come yeah. back for the word. Yeah, I will definitely make up some sentences. That'll be a good drill. And then I'll also throw in there just regular. I don't remember. I don't yeah. know. So that you have to think like, oh, is it really or? Yeah. You know, is it not yeah. it really? Okay. And then I'll, I'm going to talk to, I talked to Robert yesterday, but I'll know more today. So I'll let you know. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I'm, I might be tied up this afternoon, so I don't know if you were going to call me today, but if I don't answer, okay. Just, or you can text me, whatever okay. is easier. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Sounds good. All right. And have a great rest of your day. You too. And have a good weekend. Okay. You too. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Okay, bye.